All right. Hello, everybody. Today we will be talking about mitochondria, which are very important organelles in which we will see many metabolic pathways are taking place. Uh, and we will cover the metabolic pathways that occur in mitochondria in more detail once we get there. But today's lecture is going to be about mitochondria generally, about their structure, about some of their components. Uh, and in the second half of the lecture, we will talk about um, the origin of mitochondria, or what hypotheses there are, how mitochondria actually came to be. And at the very end of the lecture, we will talk a little bit about mitochondrial genetics and mitochondrial diseases. So that's the plan for today. And before we get into the details of mitochondrial structure, unfortunately, it's a little bit too much light, uh, but anyway, I usually like to start with showing a, a, a microscopic picture of mitochondria from an actual cell. Hopefully you can see at least a little bit there. Uh, the most common kind of schematic picture that you find in uh, textbooks and popular science books, etc., are mitochondria as these little bean-shaped organelles with some internal structure. But actually, once we, when we take a real cell and look at, we stain mitochondria with specific stains, uh, what we see is this kind of long tubular structures connected into a network, basically, uh, a reticulum, uh, which looks something like this. So what do you see there, and I understand that it's not perfectly visible because it's too much light, but um, what do you see there, this is, this is a, uh, a mouse cell it's a immature muscle cell. So it would, if uh, incentivized enough, it would fuse into muscle fibers. So it's a myoblast. And what you see there is an outline of a cell uh, and the, the black circle inside is where the nucleus would be. But of course, we are only staining for mitochondria. So we can't see the nucleus because it's not stained. So this is just to give you uh, probably a more realistic picture of what mitochondria actually look like in cells. This is a live cell, so this is what it would look like. Of course, we can also cut through those mitochondria and look at the internal structure. Now, this picture, of course, is from an electron microscope, so we wouldn't be able to see the internal structure using a light microscope. Um, and we will talk about the internal structure this is what an electronogram of a basically a cross-section of mitochondria would look like. And this is a 3D reconstruction. So this is from, uh, from electron tomography. So a 3D reconstruction of a cross-section of a mitochondria. And as you can see, uh, so on your left, what you see is the internal structure similar to what we saw in the electronogram in the cross-section. But here we've reconstructed uh, the, uh, the internal parts, and we will you know, talk about what they're called. And on the right-hand side, from your point of view, there are just different types of these internal folds of the membrane, which we call cristae, and we'll see that in detail. And you can see that some of them are very short, and some of them are long, and spanning the whole thing. Overall, when we stack them right next to each other, so, so they are really filling the, the complete inside of the mitochondria. So this is what mitochondria look like in real life. And now we will talk more about what that means, what the components are, what the different parts are, what the different compartments are, etc. All right, so <coughs> mitochondria, these kind of organelles, as you undoubtedly know, are quite uh, different from other organelles, not all organelles, but most organelles, in that they contain two membranes. So they are, they involve two distinct membranes, uh, which is unlike most organelles, but some other organelles also have two membranes. What other organelle? Hmm? The nucleus, yeah, the nucleus is a duplicated membrane. So in this case, they are similar, uh, but there, as we'll see, there are many differences in uh, the structure of mitochondria. So in a mitochondrion, again, Imagine that we're basically looking at a cross-section of those long tubular things, okay? Um, we recognize the outer membrane, the mitochondrial outer membrane. And then we have the inner membrane. 
and the inner membrane is folded, as we saw, and we can still see on this tomograph, is folded into structures which we call cristae. So these are cristae made out of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, and as we as we can see, in most functioning cells, these cristae fill the whole space inside the mitochondria. Okay, now these two membranes and the way they are arranged forms several different they form several different or separate several different compartments in the mitochondria. So if we look here, what what is this compartment? It's the cytosol. Yeah. Okay. That's the cytosol. Then we have the outer membrane. Then we have this space here, which is called the intermembrane space. It's the space between membranes, so it's called the intermembrane space. Now, the, the two membranes that we have there, they are, I mean, dimension-wise, they are the same thickness. They are approximately the same thickness, those two membranes, both the outer and inner mitochondrial membrane are about the same, same thickness, which is about the same as the thickness of any other biological membrane. So how thick are membranes, approximately? Six to eight nanometers, seven nanometers, yeah, these are all correct numbers. Okay, so there we are, between six to eight nanometers, approximately. So they are both the same. And if we take the, those places where the inner mitochondrial membrane comes in close contact with the outer mitochondrial membrane, the distance between the membranes is only about 20 nanometers. Okay, so you can see that this space here, and you can sort of see it there as well, that the two membranes, when they come into close contact, are actually not very far from each other. Okay, it's just about 20 nanometers distance. 20 nanometers. Okay, so not a lot of space there. In fact, the majority of all the intermembrane space, and we will talk about the intermembrane space quite a bit because it, it has some important functions, most of the intermembrane space is actually inside the cristae. Okay, hopefully you can see that, that this is also intermembrane space. Even though we can't really see the outer membrane there because the space is, is really enclosed between two folds of the inner membrane. Can you see that? But it's still the same space as this one, only there is no outer membrane nearby, okay? And this is quite important because it allows to keep the composition of the intermembrane space separate, separated from the cytosol and from the rest of it because we are so far deep in a, in a fold that there is very little exchange with the outside of the mitochondria. So it's functionally very important, yep? Okay, so this is the outer membrane. Sorry, the inner membrane. Yeah, and this is the inner membrane. So the inner membrane is folded into cristae. It's the same thing. It's just the folds of the inner membrane are called cristae. Okay? So the whole structure wouldn't be the cristae. It would just be the folds of the inner membrane. What other structure? It's the same thing. No, I don't mean other structure. I mean like the whole structure of like the cristae. It's the inner membrane, yes. Okay, there's nothing else. The inner membrane is folded into cristae. Yep, all right. So, we have the intermembrane space, which is here, but mostly it is down inside the cristae. And then, of course, the, the remaining space, which is between the cristae, is the matrix, is the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, so the stuff which is inside, which is enclosed by the inner membrane, is the matrix. Okay, we have the outer membrane, we have the intermembrane space, then we have the inner membrane, and what's inside the inner membrane is the matrix. But since it is all folded like this, there, there is no huge space that will be filled with the matrix. The matrix is just between the cristae, okay? Remember when we talked about the composition of the intracellular fluid, we said that all the intracellular fluid is no 
solution, no aqueous solution where everything, where things can just easily move around. It's a very thick gel, okay? So everywhere we see that things are happening, they have to be happening very close by. We can't really allow, we, we can't really require long distance diffusion because it would take forever and we would lose a lot of energy and it just can't be done. So all these spaces in well-functioning mitochondria are very small, okay? Because we can't really diffuse very far away. All right. People are very loud there. Okay, um, so these are the compartments in, the, in mitochondria. And these compartments, they are functionally not completely separate, but they are distinct. And part of the distinct nature of these compartments is also caused by the differences between the two membranes, between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So both membranes are biological membranes like any other membrane. And all biological membranes are composed of phospholipids, anything else, cholesterol, and proteins, okay? In fact, a normal biological membrane like the plasma membrane contains about 50% proteins, okay? So when somebody asks you, what are biological membranes composed of, you should say phospholipids and proteins, okay? It's, all, it's never just phospholipids. There's actually a lot of proteins, okay? So that's the general composition of biological membranes. But there are some differences in mitochondrial membranes. So they're also, their lipids are mainly phospholipids. And specifically, the majority of phospholipids in both the outer and the inner membrane are phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylcholine. Okay, so phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylethanolamine are the main, compo main lipid components of both of these membranes. That wouldn't be on its own quite surprising because that's what the plasma membrane contains as well. Okay, so there's no surprise here. What is different in mitochondrial membranes is that they contain very little cholesterol, almost no cholesterol. Okay, so normal biological membranes like the plasma, mem plasma membrane contain quite a bit of cholesterol. The mitochondrial membranes do not contain a lot of cholesterol, just very tiny amounts of cholesterol. So that's a big difference, okay? The other big difference from, uh, from normal biological membranes pertains to the inner mitochondrial membrane because that's even more different. It also contains very low amounts of cholesterol, almost no cholesterol. But the inner membrane additionally contains a, a special type of phospholipid which we don't really find anywhere else, which is called cardiolipin. Cardiolipin. Uh, the name comes from the fact that it was first isolated from the heart because heart, the heart muscle has a lot of mitochondria, okay? So that's why it was discovered. But it's present not just in the heart, it's present in all mitochondria in our body. And cardiolipin is a special phospholipid. It's basically a double phospholipid, okay? So if we take a generic phospholipid looking something like this. What is the name of this molecule? It's called phosphatidic acid, okay? A very important phospholipid, phosphatidic acid. And if we take two molecules of phosphatidic acid and bind them to one molecule of glycerol, we get cardiolipin. So this would be the structure of cardiolipin. Okay, phosphatidic acid, glycerol, and another phosphatidic acid bound together. Okay, and this kind of double phospholipid is a, an important component of the inner mitochondrial membrane. There is about 20% of all the phospholipids in the inner membrane is cardiolipin. 
and it probably serves two very important functions there. First of all, it allows the membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane, to fold into such tight folds, which otherwise probably would be impossible, and the membrane would start fusing or something. It, it just would not fold as nicely. So cardiolipin is probably an important part of why, it can, why we can fold the inner membrane uh, into such tight folds. The other important functional implication of cardiolipin is that it is needed for the correct function of of proteins which are in the inner mitochondrial membrane. We'll talk about those proteins tomorrow, especially in the, in the lecture about the respiratory chain. And cardiolipin molecules which coat those proteins are important for the function. If we strip them away, the proteins stop functioning or they, they don't function as well as, 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 as they did, okay? So th this, these are at least two rows of cardiolipin why it is crucial for the inner membrane. No, it is not. Yes. Okay. Is it uh, also in the inner and outer? It is in the inner membrane. Only in the inner membrane. It is just in the, I mean, there may be some very small amounts in the outer membrane, but, but mainly it is in the inner membrane. Okay. So that's the, the composition of the phospholipids, but as we said, all, membrane, all membranes actually contain a lot of proteins. So the outer membrane, similar to, for example, the plasma membrane, contains about 50% proteins. But the inner membrane, again, is unique in that it contains about 75% protein, okay? So it is actually mostly composed of proteins, okay? About 75% of the inner membrane are proteins. That's the composition of the membranes, but they do have some important functional differences as well. One of them is that the outer mitochondrial membrane is relatively freely permeable to most things, okay? Actually, anything smaller than about 10 kilodaltons will easily go in and out of the outer membrane. And the reason why that is so is that it contains a lot of channels called porins, which are non-selective channels that allow relatively big molecules to just easily flow in and out. Okay, so the outer membrane is very permeable. It's not really permeable for big proteins, and we'll see in this lecture how proteins get in. There is a special way to do that. But most small molecules will easily flow in and out through the outer membrane. The inner membrane, on the other hand, is extremely impermeable. Okay, so almost nothing can go through the inner membrane, either in or out only things that have specific transporters. So there, is, there are about 50 different transporters, only 50 different transporters in the inner membrane, and that's it. So what does not have a specific transporter cannot get into the mitochondrion or out, okay? So the permeability of the outer membrane is completely free, almost completely free. The permeability of the inner membrane is very tightly controlled, okay? So very few things can go in and out, and it's very tightly controlled what goes in and out, okay? So big, big difference between these two membranes, big functional difference. All right. Uh, if you're interested, I mean, it's not super important, but for cardiolipin, I mean, maybe you remember uh, when we talk about general phospholipids like phosphatidylcholine in membranes, um, what kind of fatty acids do we find in these phospholipids? Could be palmitic. It's not the most common one. Huh? They could be linoleic, yeah. But usually what we have is that in one position we have a saturated fatty acid and in the other position we have a polyunsaturated fatty acid. That's a very common, uh, that's a very common configuration, okay? In normal phospholipids. In cardiolipin, most of the fatty acids, if not all, are actually linoleic acids. So it's all polyunsaturated fatty acids that also makes makes it a bit different from the, uh, from the other, okay? So there are no saturated fatty acids, all polyunsaturated fatty acids. It's just interesting, okay? It's not super important, but just an interesting fact. Yeah? So one side is saturated and the other side is unsaturated? In a normal phospholipid, in phosphatidylcholine, yes. In cardiolipin, it's all unsaturated fatty acids. Okay. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Good. So 
we talked a lot about uh, the membranes. Let's now have a look at the matrix itself, so the filling, so to speak, of the mitochondrion. Well, similar to the cytosol, where we said that there is a high concentration of proteins in the cytosol, does anyone recall what the concentration is approximately? In the cytosol, concentration of proteins in the cytosol? Of what, 50? 50 is a number, that's not a concentration. 50% concentration, okay. In the cytosol, that's quite a bit less, okay. It's about 10% concentration of, of <coughs> proteins. It's about 100 grams per liter, okay. It's still a very thick solution. It's about the concentration of proteins in an egg white, okay. So a cytosol has the consistency of an egg white, okay. It's a pretty thick thing. In the mitochondrial matrix, the concentration of proteins is much higher. It's estimated to be about 500 grams per milliliter. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, per liter. 500 grams per liter, okay? So that is about 50% concentration. So 50% of the matrix are proteins. It's a very, very thick environment where no diffusion of anything bigger than gases or something is possible and all the metabolic pathways have to, have, have to occur very close to each other, otherwise it would be just impossible to move things around, okay? So about 500 grams per liter, very high concentration of proteins in the matrix. Now, those are not the only things that mitochondria contain. They also contain, and this makes them completely unique in our cells, they also contain their own DNA, and they contain their own ribosomes, and they contain their own proteosynthetic apparatus, okay? So, this is really unique. No other, no other uh, organelle, apart from the nucleus and the mitochondrion, contain DNA. And this DNA in the mitochondrion is distinct from the DNA in the nucleus. Okay, so those are different genomes. The mitochondrial DNA is a circular molecule. So we, we can call it a circular chromosome, okay? And it is pretty small. Compared to the nuclear genome, it is quite small. It contains the length of mitochondrial DNA, okay, if we split the ring and if we just looked at the length, is only 16,000 base pairs, or 16 kilo base pairs, okay, 16,000 bases, basically. Compared to the billions and billions of base pairs in the nucleus, this is tiny. It's a very small DNA. But it's absolutely crucial because it carries a total of 37 genes, again, not a lot, okay, 37 genes, and we have tens of thousands of genes in the nucleus. But these genes, or rather the products of these genes, are absolutely vital, okay? We could not survive without them. Uh, out of these 37 genes, only 13 proteins are synthesized from them, are coded. So only 13 out of these code for proteins, okay? So we have 13 proteins. What do you think would the rest of the genes code for? Definitely. So we have two molecules of ribosomal RNA because we said, well, I said, that mitochondria contain also their own ribosomes which are distinct from the ribosomes that are in the rest of the cell. They're different ribosomes. So yes, they contain their, there are two, two genes for RNA, and the rest are for, for tRNA, absolutely. So 22 tRNA molecules, because we need to build proteins, so we need tRNA. Again, it's a different tRNA than in the rest of the cell. So, this is what the, this tiny but absolutely crucial mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial chromosome, codes for. And as you can see, I mean, there are just 13 proteins which are coded by this. All of these proteins are part of the respiratory chain, of the complexes of the respiratory chain, 
plus ATP synthase. So all of them are found in the respiratory chain and ATP syn synthase. That's something that we'll be talking about tomorrow. The respiratory chain and ATP synthase. We'll cover that tomorrow, okay, in quite some detail. But of course, mitochondria don't just contain 13 proteins, okay, they will be too little. They actually contain thousands of proteins. Where are these proteins coming from? Well, they are coming from the nucleus and from the cytosol. So the majority, 99.9% .9 of all proteins that we find in mitochondria are actually produced from genes that are in the nucleus in the cytosol, in ribosomes that are in the cytosol, okay? And then, once they are produced in the cytosol, they have to be imported into mitochondria. Now, I said that thanks to porins, the outer membrane is quite freely permeable for things, but for things that are smaller, smaller than 10,000 deltons, okay? Proteins generally are much bigger than that. So we have to have a special transporter, special machinery for putting the, the proteins into mitochondria. And this machinery, just one second, this machinery is composed of two large complexes containing many subunits. And the, the one part or the one complex which is in the outer membrane is called the translocator of the outer membrane or TUM. And there is a partner which is on the inner membrane, they are very close to each other, which is called TIM, translocator of the inner membrane. And these two huge complexes, which are composed of many, many, many proteins, basically take the protein from the cytosol, they unravel it, okay, they, they break down the, the 3D structure, and then pull the, uh, the polypeptide chain into the, first into the intermembrane space and then potentially into the, uh, into the inner membrane and then into the matrix. It's a very complex process. Some of the steps are still not quite well understood how that works, okay? It's a very complicated thing. And this TOM-TIM complex allows the proteins coming from the cytosol to get either into the, to be inserted either into the outer membrane, into the intermembrane space, into the inner membrane, or into the matrix, depending on where they belong. Okay, very complicated process, highly regulated. The ribosomes, yeah, they are in the matrix. Okay, so the ribosomes, the DNA, it's all in the matrix. Okay, that's where the proteosynthesis happens and everything is in the matrix. Now, I drew here this little circular molecule of mitochondrial DNA. However, mitochondria contain hundreds or thousands of copies of this mitochondrial DNA. So it's not just one. I mean, the DNA is usually closely associated with the inner membrane, but there are thousands or at least hundreds of copies of mitochondrial DNA in there. Now, the mitochondrial DNA differs not just in the size and the sequence from the nuclear DNA, but it also differs in the way it is organized. So you either heard, or you will hear in more detail, how the nuclear chromosomes are organized. They contain a lot of proteins. The, the DNA is wound around proteins called histones. Okay, lots of components which organize this very, very long DNA molecule or molecules in the nucleus. The mitochondrial chromosome is much simpler. Okay, it does not have any histones. There are some additional proteins which are connected to it, but the whole organization of the mitochondrial genome is much, much, much simpler, which also means that the mitochondrial DNA is more sensitive to damage. It's not as well protected as the nuclear DNA. And since at the same time, and this is something that we'll cover at a later lecture, uh, a lot of reactive oxygen species are produced in mitochondria, these free radicals, which can damage DNA. So the combination of the DNA being relatively naked, it's not completely naked, there are some proteins protecting it, but it's not as protected as nuclear one. And at the same time, 
lots of radicals are produced, this means that the DNA is easily damaged. That could be part of the reason why we have so many different copies of mitochondrial DNA in the mitochondria, because that means that some of them, some of the molecules can be damaged and the mitochondrion is still continuing and, and working normally because it's producing enough of these, uh, of these 13 protein subunits, et cetera, okay? We'll come back to that towards the end of the lecture when we talk about mitochondrial diseases because this has implications for how these work and how, how they develop. All right, uh, the, the last thing in which mitochondrial DNA differs, just one second, uh, differs from the nuclear DNA is that the genes, the mitochondrial genes, do not contain any introns. So you've heard that our genes in the nuclear, uh, in the nuclear DNA, when they are transcribed, they contain introns which need to be spliced out, which need to be cut out for the gene to then be translated on, on ribosomes the mitochondrial genes do not contain any introns, introns. So basically the whole thing is then translated into a protein, okay? Quite a big difference. Again, it will, hopefully it will become important in the second half of the lecture when we talk about the origin of, uh, of mitochondria. All right, uh, there was a question, yeah. So the ribosomes are the in Yeah, the Mitochondrial ribosomes, apart from the rRNA, that's the only thing that's produced in mitochondria, the whole ribosome, all the proteins of the mitochondrial ribosome are produced in the nucleus and then they are imported into the matrix. Okay, so they're not coded by the mitochondrial DNA. Yeah, good question. What was the function of having, so instead of being um, independent, the mitochondria being independent from the eukaryotic cell, what was the function of it? Uh, we'll talk about that in the second half of the lecture a little bit. Okay, yeah? Then before that, DNA, arrangement of the nucleolid, like the nucleotide, nucleolid, and then the nucleolid. Nucleolid, yeah? Yeah, because you told that there's no histones, but also protein, yeah? Yeah, there are, there are no histones here, okay? There are other proteins which they don't quite serve the same function, but they do coat the DNA to form what is called nucleoids, okay, which are little particles containing DNA and proteins. So yes, they are arranged in nucleoids, but there are no histones there. Okay. All right. This was the structure, components, composition of mitochondria. Again, a lot of these things will be coming back once we talk about the respiratory chain and other met metabolic pathways that occur in mitochondria, okay? So this is a little bit of a prep work, prep work that we will need uh, later on. I suggest we make a five minute break and after the break, we'll talk about the origin of mitochondria. All right, so, all the differences that we talked about between mitochondria and some of the other parts of the cell have led people, so for example, the presence of DNA, the presence of, mitochondria, of ribosomes and other things, have led people to start thinking that maybe mitochondria were originally a distinct organism which ended up living and being, being engulfed by some other organism that in fact mitochondria are the result of what we call endosymbiosis. And this is the, the content of the endosymbiotic theory. Of the origin of mitochondria. Now we'll get to the endosymbiotic theory, but interestingly, this theory is in effect older than any of the knowledge of the composition of mitochondria. It's actually much older than even the discovery of the DNA or rather the, 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 the fact that DNA is, is uh, the genetic material, etc. The first person to have suggested that maybe some organisms may have formed a symbiotic relationship and ended up basically living together inside a cell was a Russian biologist called Konstantin Merashkovsky, who in 1905, 
when he was studying plant cells, he looked at plant cells and he saw the chloroplasts under a microscope. And the chloroplasts looked like green bacteria. So he came with this, with this theory, with this idea that maybe chloroplasts originally, or maybe even still are, green bacteria which live inside the plant cell okay, as a symbiotic organism. Now, Mereshkovsky didn't come up with this idea from, like, you know, from the blue sky. Uh, there was, in fact, in the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, there was a very influential school in biology which suggested in opposition to Darwinism, because Darwinism says, or you know, in one form of Darwinism is saying that the evolution of organisms is driven by competition. Okay, organisms are competing, the strongest survive, they pass their genes on, and that's how evolution works. Okay, natural selection uh, by this competition, basically. But an opposing school in biology to some extent opposing, developed at about the same time as Darwinism, which said, wait, wait, actually, evolution is to a large part driven by cooperation. Organisms cooperate. And this is what drives evolution, because they find ways how to cooperate and how to be more successful in cooperation. Uh, one of the big proponents, one of the major proponents of this idea of cooperation being the the driving force of, um, of evolution was another Russian biologist and geographer called Peter Kropotkin. And he came up with this idea of cooperation as a driving force by observing nature. Okay? He traveled a lot in Siberia and elsewhere and he was observing animals, how they live together and how they work together and observed interspecies cooperation, etc. So, okay? very influential uh, biologist. Uh, he is actually one of the founders of anarchism as well. Okay, so he, he kind of projected the findings from biology into a political ideology saying, okay, well, people should not be just competing with each other, they should be collaborating and they should form a society where collaboration is you know, helping uh, the, the common good. Okay, so Kropotkin, super important. For his political views, he was exiled. Uh, he couldn't live in Russia, and he only came back after the 1917 revolution. After the October Revolution, he came back to Moscow and became a big political celebrity. He died short after that because he was quite old. Anyway, so Mereshkovsky probably came, came up with this idea that maybe chloroplasts are some organisms which are living in symbiosis, based at least partly on the ideas of Kropotkin. Uh, now, this theory of symbiosis was not really accepted at the time. Okay, very few people noticed it. There were some in Germany who kind of were saying, yeah, maybe, maybe even mitochondria could potentially be organisms, but nobody took it seriously. This endosymbiotic theory then resurfaced in 1960s, in 1966, where uh, a, a biologist in the US uh, called Lynn Margulis At the time, she was called Lynn Sagan because she was married to a very famous astronomer and astrophysicist, Carl Sagan, who was a super celebrity at the time. He was a popularizer of, of astronomy and everything, lots of movies and, and TV programs, etc. So they were married at the time. So when she published the paper, she was called Lynn Sagan, but she's now known as Lynn Margulis because they divorced, and this is her maiden name. Uh, Lynn Margulis brought about quite a few arguments for a theory that both chloroplasts and mitochondria are just remnants or descendants of formerly independent organisms, which over the billions of years of evolution changed sufficiently that now they look like organelles, but they used to be independent. Again, this theory did not come up just from the blue sky, okay? Uh, there was a, another school or movement forming in biology, um, which is connected especially with the name of James Lovelock. Uh, I'm not sure if this name rings a bell. He was the originator, the creator of the Gaia hypothesis. 
of the Gaia hypothesis, which basically said that the whole Earth works like one big organism. That all the different parts of the Earth, not just living ones, but even the non-living ones, okay, like seas and geography and continents and geology and stuff like that, works as one big organism together to keep a stable environment on Earth. Super interesting, influential, controversial theory, very famous, okay? So it was about the same time, and Lynn Margulis was one of the closest uh, collaborators with Lovelock on this theory, okay? Usually it's connected with his name, not with her name, as it often happens, uh, but she was very much involved in the formulation of the theory, and she, she's one of the parents of, of this Gaia theory. So again, her thinking about organisms was based on this idea that things, living and non-living things should be working together or are working together uh, to keep stable environment. And that's probably what informed this, bringing this endosymbiotic theory back to the fore. Again, it was mostly ignored, okay? But in the coming years, so this was in 1966, but in the coming years, there were huge developments in molecular biology, in the study of mitochondria, and the study of cells. And more and more information came up, which started to support this idea that indeed mitochondria seem to be closely related to bacteria, actually more closely related to bacteria than they are related to the cytoplasm or the, to the rest of the cell, to the nucleus. Okay, more and more, uh, yeah, more and more uh, discoveries came which supported this and currently this endosymbiotic theory is accepted by virtually everybody in biology that this is how mitochondria and also chloroplasts came about. Uh, the, the supporting evidence is the, in the autonomous DNA, the structure of the DNA, so the, the sequences are actually quite close to structures of some bacteria. Okay? The ribosomes are similar to some bacterial ribosomes. They're not exactly the same, but they're quite similar. Okay? So lots of similarities which said, okay, well, maybe these originally really were bacteria. Now, the big question, and one which is still not satisfactorily answered, is how did it happen? Okay? Why did two cells, one of them a bacterium, the other one we don't quite know, but I will tell you what the most likely version is. How did they, you know, you know, what did they do for each other in order to form a symbiotic relationship which would then survive for three and a half billion years? Okay, that's a long time. Okay. Uh, and in fact, currently we believe that this fusion in event, this creation of mitochondria, occurred only once in the whole history of the Earth. Or rather, maybe it occurred more times, but all the bacteria, all the mitochondria in the world currently are the descendants of just one cell. Okay, so maybe it happened, but they all died out. Okay, so all the eukaryotic cells that contain mitochondria, and even some that don't contain mitochondria, are descendants of this one cell, which, which, or this one symbiotic organism. Okay, which is quite incredible, right? Um, it happened once and it just spread around the earth, uh, yeah. So, uh, how did it come about? From what we know today about mitochondria, it is quite tempting to say, well, uh, the former bacterium, which then became a mitochondrion, uh, was using oxygen for oxidative metabolism because that's what mitochondria currently do and it was producing a lot of ATP. And the other partner in this relationship, in this symbiotic relationship, liked the ATP and was using it for its own reactions, okay? And that's why they started living together, okay? Maybe, the, maybe one of them, the, the partner who was just taking, just engulfed a bacterium and started using its, its stores of ATP or something. Well, this is almost definitely not true. And there are a few reasons why this idea, it was about oxygen and ATP, could not be true. First of all, at the time of this event, when the two cells fused together or started you know, living in a symbiotic relationship, there wasn't really that much oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay? 
the, the big amount of oxygen that we see now is actually a relatively late development, and it came with photosynthetic organisms, with plants, etc. Okay, so this early on, these three billion years ago, there was actually very little or almost no oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. So oxygen was probably not it, or definitely not it in the beginning. The other reason why this is unlikely to have been true is that there are no, there exist no bacteria which would be producing excess ATP and would be just sending it to its environment, to its environment, to the surroundings. Okay, it would be just making too much ATP that they would just give it off. Okay, it was never found. Such an organism was never found. It's very unlikely that any organism would be doing that. It would be very expensive, and why would they do it? Right, makes no sense at all. So it almost definitely was not this. This. Now, how was it exactly? We don't know. But currently, the most accepted theory, it's not perfect, but it, it explains a lot of things, is what is called a hydrogen theory. And the hydrogen theory is basically saying that the two cells that fused together and one of them became the rest of the cell, okay, the other one become, became a mitochondrion, okay, so the, the relationship between them, the symbiotic relationship, was based on hydrogen. Now, how did it work? Well, the, the, the bacterium, the cell that will become a mitochondrion, was part of a big, big, big group of, of uh, bacteria, which is called, or they are called, eubacteria. In fact, maybe some of you had enough biology to have done some like phylogenetics and stuff like that. Uh, you will know that all bacteria only are part of two groups, eubacteria and archibacteria. Okay? Now we actually don't call them archibacteria anymore. They are called archaeota, but it's the same thing. Okay? Uh, so all bacteria are just in these two groups. One of them was a eubacterium more specifically an alpha proteobacterium or something like that, but that's not super important, okay? The other partner in this future relationship was an archaeota, or an archibacterium in the old terminology. Now, the, the archibacterium, the archaeota, was an autotrophic bacterium. And it was using carbon dioxide from the environment and hydrogen from the environment. Because remember, in the old days, in the beginnings of Earth and in the beginnings of, of uh, life, there were all these gases and all these metals just coming from the Earth. There was no oxygen to oxidize them, so there was a huge availability of these things, like hydrogen. Okay? Nowadays, we don't really find that much hydrogen in the environment, but at the time, there was quite a lot of it. So the archibacterium was using hydrogen and carbon dioxide, plus some other things, to produce most likely methane. So it was taking in carbon dioxide and hydrogen. It was an autotrophic organism. It was building all its uh, organic compounds. And as a waste product, it was leaving, uh, it, it was excreting methane. And we do know, even today, we do know a lot of Archibacteria which produce methane, methanogenic bacteria, they do exist. Okay? So it's not completely impossible that this was the case. Now, what about the future mitochondrion? The future mitochondrion, on the other hand, so this was an autotrophic cell, the future mitochondrion was a heterotrophic bacterium. So it was taking in complex organic compounds, which already existed in the environment. Okay? So organic compounds. And it was fermenting them, it was breaking them down to get energy and everything what it, what it needed. And as a waste product, it produced hydrogen. Okay, so the protobacterium probably was taking complex organic compounds, breaking them down, and as one of its waste products, it was releasing hydrogen. And now you can already see what the relationship was about or could have been about. A waste product of one cell, which wanted to get rid of it, became the feeding stock of the other cell, which wanted to get as much of it as possible. Okay? 
So it made sense, and there was an advantage for both of these cells to be together. Now, this is probably, it's one hypothesis, this is how this symbiotic relationship started. And over time, it was only over time, when the concentration of oxygen started rising in the environment through photosynthesis and production of, of oxygen by all the green stuff, the, the fact that the original eubacterium, the original mitochondrion, could also, under some conditions, start using oxygen. So it had the ability to use oxygen, but the amount of oxygen is very small in the environment, so it wasn't probably important in the beginning. But as the concentration of oxygen started rising, the oxygen became very toxic for the other partner because the production of methane, the enzymes that produce methane, are very sensitive to oxygen. That's why nowadays most archaebacteria, which are methanogenic, they have to live you know, like in ponds and lakes in the mud because, because any oxygen would destroy them very quickly. Okay? So they can't really, oxygen is very toxic for them. So it looks like the other partner, the future mitochondrion, originally was just detoxifying, was getting rid of the oxygen, which was too toxic. And then, as the concentration of oxygen rose further still, the oxidative metabolism, this getting rid of oxygen, developed into what we now have as oxidative phosphorylation, where we use oxygen to actually produce ATP. So this, this was not the first step, but this was a long development to get there. And of course, these two cells then were fused together. We don't quite know how that happened, okay? And over billions of years, many of the genes from the DNA in the mitochondrion were transferred into the DNA of the host, which became the nucleus and the cytoplasm. In fact, many of the metabolic pathways of the proto-mitochondrion were also transferred into the cytoplasm. So for example, glycolysis. Glycolysis was originally the pathway of the eubacterium, even though nowadays we don't really find it in the mitochondrion anymore. Okay, it was transferred into the cytoplasm, but it probably most likely came from the mitochondrion, only it's not there anymore and it's in the cytoplasm already. Okay? which makes sense because it was a heterotrophic organism. It had to break down complex substances and glycolysis is breaking down of, of glucose, right? So it sort of makes sense how that would be, but it's a bit unintuitive or counterintuitive saying glycolysis originally was a mitochondrial pathway, but now it isn't. It was transferred. All right, so that's the current leading hypothesis. We still don't know if this is what happens and there are some issues with this, with this hypothesis, but there is no better hypothesis than this one. So this is probably how mitochondria originated. Now, for chloroplasts, the fusion with chloroplasts, future chloroplasts, happened much later. So this was the, the first fusion event which actually created all eukaryotic cells. As I said, all eukaryotic, cell, eukaryotic cells that exist are the descendants of this one symbiotic relationship, okay? The fusion to form chloroplasts happened later and it happened probably more than once. Okay, so this happened just once, but the, for chloroplasts, we do have probably different fusion events which created uh, chloroplasts independently. But we're not going to be talking about chloroplasts because we don't have them. Uh, so this is just uh, for those who are interested. All right, any questions about this? Yeah. In the upper corner? Archaeota? Organic. organic. Yeah, complex organic compounds. It's a heterotrophic bacterium. Good. Yeah? As I said, all eukaryotic cells, animal, plant, fungi, protists, are all descendants of this fusion, all eukaryotic cells. So we have bacteria, eubacteria, archaeota, and then we have eukaryotic cells, and they are all the result of a fusion of those two. So we could say that all eukaryotic cells are descendants of both of these bacterial branches, okay? We fuse them together, and that's what gives us all eukaryotic cells. 
Boom. Good. So the last topic that I want to talk about is mitochondrial genetics and mitochondrial diseases. Now, as you probably know, the, uh, all mitochondria come from the all site. They come from the mother. Okay? So when, uh, when the egg fuses, or rather when the, uh, the sperm enters the, the egg, no mitochondria from the sperm enter the egg, and if they do, they are destroyed. Okay? So we get all our mitochondria from the mother, from the, from the egg. There was a publication about five years ago now where they discovered a family in China where it looked like they had some, they inherited some mitochondria from their father as well, okay? And it was very unusual, it was a very controversial thing, and it was saying, okay, the dogma of mitochondria being passed only from the, from the mother is dead. But it wasn't, because it was found that it's an exception, because this family had a mutation in one of the members of the machinery for destroying the sperm mitochondria, okay? So it may happen that some of the sperm mitochondria get into the oocyte, but in a normally functioning egg, they are destroyed. There's a special mechanism for destroying the, the male mitochondria, okay? But in this family, there was a mutation in this machinery, and some of the uh, some of the mitochondria from the sperm actually survived in the zygote, in the developing embryo, uh, and that's why there was this inheritance. But it's clearly a very rare occurrence, okay? So it is really true that the majority of people get all their mitochondria from the mother, from the egg, okay? And no mitochondria, or virtually no mitochondria from the, uh, from the sperm. Um, well, I mean, they, the... We'll, we'll get to mitochondrial diseases, so I will explain how that works, but they had a mixed phenotype based on the, uh, the mitochondria because, of course, they had a mixed genotype as well because they're obviously carrying... The, so I don't think there was any like, big difference, but it was possible to be detected, especially through genetic tools, that they had different types of mitochondrial DNA uh, in their cells. Now, since the mitochondrial DNA is encoding these these 37 genes, which are important for mitochondrial function, they're absolutely crucial, okay? Without mitochondrial DNA, we would not have functioning mitochondria. This also means that if the mother in the egg, if there are any mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, this means that it's possible that these mutations are transferred onto the embryo, the zygote embryo and, and a child, and the child can develop what we call a mitochondrial disease. So mitochondrial disease is a disease which is caused by dysfunctional mitochondria, and they are genetically caused. So they're genetic disorders. They are inherited disorders. Okay, so those are mitochondrial diseases. Now, until quite recently, it was thought that mitochondrial diseases are very rare. Okay? So normally they wouldn't even be taught in medical school very much because it would be a very special topic just for you know, pediatric specialists, and maybe sometimes you will find a, a child with a, the with a mitochondrial disease. Now we know that mitochondrial diseases are actually the most common hereditary diseases uh, of all the genetic dis the disorders, okay? The frequency of all mitochondrial diseases put together is about one in 4,000. It's a, it's a pretty common thing. Now, how is it possible that for so long we thought that they were extremely rare? Well, the reason is that they are very difficult to diagnose and their symptoms are very confusing. They are mixed symptoms and it's very difficult to figure out what is going on, okay? Uh, I will give you a couple of examples of these disorders just to see how strange they are. So one mitochondrial disorder has the abbreviation DAD, which stands for deafness and diabetes. So the, the children affect, afflicted by this will have a combination of a loss of hearing and diabetes. Okay? Strange. Okay? The other syndrome has the abbreviation of MELAS, which stands for myopathy, encephalopathy, and lactic acidosis. Very strange. Okay? So until it was found that indeed these disorders are caused by mitochondrial dysfunction, 
it was, it was baffling. Nobody knew what these things were, and that's why a lot of these were not diagnosed, okay? So you would have children that weren't really growing very much, and they had some neurological problems and maybe some muscle problems, and nobody knew what was wrong with them. And now we know that many of these are caused by dysfunctional mitochondria because of mutations either in the mitochondrial DNA, transmitted from the mother through the egg and the mitochondria in the egg, or we do also have mitochondrial diseases which are caused by mutations in the nuclear genome because remember, 99.9% .9 of all the proteins in the mitochondria, including ribosomes and everything, are created, are coded in the nucleus and are created in the cytoplasm. So we can have mitochondrial diseases which are transmitted through the mother, through mitochondrial DNA, but we also have mitochondrial diseases which, are, which have a normal Mendelian genetics, okay, and they are stored or they, the, the problem is in the nuclear DNA and they will also cause disorders of mitochondrial function. This bizarre, or these bizarre symptoms or combinations of symptoms of mitochondrial diseases are caused by a couple of factors. Like a nor normal genetic disease like phenylketonuria, right, there's, there is no there's nothing strange about it. There's a defect in a gene, okay, and causes this, okay, simple. But these ones is not as simple. One of the reasons why we don't get clear symptoms or exactly the same symptoms is that, remember, we said that there are many copies of mitochondrial DNA in the mitochondria, and we have lots of mitochondria in each cell. So we will have, in, in different cells, we will have a different ratio of mutated mitochondrial DNA to the non-mutated mitochondrial DNA, okay? It's never all the DNA is the same, okay? In the nucleus, it has to be like this, okay? We only have two copies of each gene. Here, we have hundreds or even thousands of copies. So we get a different ratio of damaged, mutated, to non-damaged, normal mitochondrial DNA. And depending on the ratio, we will have different effects on the function of the cell. So the more mutated mitochondrial DNA we have in the cell, the more affected will be, it will be. And on the other hand, if we don't have, if we have more of the normal undamaged mitochondrial DNA, the cell will be okay. And that's why we had these strange symptoms because it really depends on the ratio and it's actually a spectrum. The symptoms are on a spectrum of really, really severe where we have a lot of damaged DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA to not as severe if there is less of it. The other reason why we have these unclear symptoms is that not all cells react the same way to dysfunctional mitochondria. For example, in cells like cardiac muscle, we need to produce a lot of ATP in order for the muscle to keep going. On the other hand, osteocytes, for example, cells in the, in the bones, they don't really need that much ATP, okay? They need it, but not as much, and not all the time. So that means that if you have damaged mitochondria, mitochondrial DNA in the heart, you will have a big symptom. If you have it somewhere else, you can have almost no symptoms at all. So for example, in the deafness and diabetes, the reason why we combine these two is that both the hair cells in the inner ear and the beta cells in the pancreas need a lot of ATP. So if you have damaged mitochondria, these will be the first ones to be damaged, and that's why we see the symptoms, even though maybe the mitochondrial DNA is damaged elsewhere as, as well, but we don't see the symptoms because osteocytes are okay with damaged mitochondria. Okay? So this is the reason why we get these unobvious, unintuitive syndromes in, um, in mitochondrial diseases. And it's very likely, since it's a relatively new area of medicine, it's very likely that by the time you are in clinical practice, you will be seeing and you will be diagnosing patients with, or you will have patients that have been diagnosed with mitochondrial disorders. Now, these mitochondrial dis disorders are not easy to treat because, well, if you have a mutation in a mitochondrial gene, it's very difficult to do anything with it. Now, most of you probably have heard about a method called CRISPR. What is CRISPR for? 
Correct. So we can use it. It's a method for editing genes. And it is now being tested or prepared or developed to treat genetic disorders. Okay? So we have a defective gene where there's a mutation in one letter or two letters, and we can use CRISPR to correct it in all the cells in the body. Okay? And they're now, in the past year or two, they're now first attempts to use it clinically, and maybe it will be. It's still difficult to use CRISPR to correct nuclear genes, but it's virtually impossible currently to use CRISPR to correct mitochondrial genes because you would have to insert the whole machinery for CRISPR through the two membranes and to get it into mitochondria. It's very hard, okay? Nobody's really cracked how to, how to do it. So maybe in the future, we will have CRISPR therapy for mitochondrial disorders, but so far, there is none, okay? No. Uh, so currently, CRISPR is only used for nuclear gene edit editing because we can have, because for CRISPR, you need some enzymes, etc. It's a quite complicated thing. And we know how to insert this machinery into nuclear genome and to correct those genes there. But nobody has yet figured out how to do it with mitochondria. Okay? So maybe in the future, we'll know that. But so far, it's, it's impossible. So currently, there are many methods for treating uh, mitochondrial diseases, but none of them is really causal. None of them really treats the cause. Um, there are some medications that can help, some vitamins, etc., and that can help some patients with mitochondrial diseases. And one of the things that is now becoming quite, there's a lot of interest in it, is ketogenic diet, a diet for, which is very poor on saccharides and is basically composed of fat and protein. And I know that it's used for other things, losing weight, et cetera, and it's very, I think it's controversial and it's probably not very good for, for healthy people. But for people with certain mitochondrial diseases, it can actually improve their condition quite significantly. We don't quite know why, okay, especially in some types of, of um, uh, mitochondrial diseases, it's unclear why the ketogenic diet should be helping, but it is, it appears to be. So that's one of those things that maybe is going to help. However, until we have these genetic treatments, we, will, we won't be able to really treat patients properly and to remove the cause. One of the recent methods, relatively recent, uh, that was developed, which is not really about treating mitochondrial diseases, but it's more about preventing the transmission of mitochondrial diseases from the mother, from the donor of the egg, to the child. So, of course, if there are mothers, if there are women, uh, who have mitochondrial diseases and they want to have a child, they want to make sure that the child does not have the damaged mitochondrial DNA. And for that, we can use a method, basically, of mitochondrial transplantation. So, what is done is, you have the oocyte, you have the egg, either fertilized or unfertilized, there are two methods, and you take away so this would be the egg with the mitochondria, with the damaged mitochondria, okay? You take out the nucleus and you put it into another egg from a different donor, from a healthy donor, where you've removed the nucleus as well, and you put the nucleus of the mother into the enucleated oocyte of the donor, which contains healthy, healthy uh, mitochondria, okay? And then you can fertilize it, or it was fertilized before, different ways. That means, one second, that means that the child, which is born f through this procedure, will have three genetic parents, okay? It will have the genetic material from the sperm, it will have the genetic material from the nucleus of the egg, and it will have the genetic material from the mitochondria, which are distinct from the mitochondria of the donor of the nucleus. And this is a method that is legal in the United Kingdom and has been for years. So there are already children that were born through this process. And it's a very interesting uh, ethical, legal thing, you know. Sorry? No, they're perfectly fine. They have a perfectly normal phenotype. Not really, because remember, the mitochondrial DNA only carries, only codes for 13 proteins, okay? It does not influence the color of your eyes, okay? It only influences how your mitochondria function, okay? So you can't see that in the kids. I mean, the kids are really kids of the 
to nuclear parents, but they do carry genetic information of a third person, which is the third genetic parent. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, it's not which they got, like it's which they got with the, the nucleus with the two they got. No, I mean, uh, there are two ways. You can do it either with just an egg, unfertilized egg. You switch the nucleus, you put it into a new cytoplasm, and then you fertilize it. Or you can first fertilize it, and then the fertilized nucleus, yes, zygote in a way, okay, once or other, you transfer to a different one. Both ways appear to work. I don't know. I think they are first fertilizing and then transferring to a different one, but I'm not 100% sure. All right. There is probably a bright future for the treatment of, uh, of mitochondrial diseases, and as I said, it's very likely you will learn more about them later on, even though they haven't been really recognized for, for many years. All right, any questions? Yes. Yeah, there are, there are lots of unanswered questions, okay? How was the nucleus formed? Was it formed after the fusion or before the fusion? Was some proto-nucleus already there? How did the archaeota, the archaebacterium, how did it actually phagocytose the cell? Because until recently, there were no archaebacteria discovered that actually have phagocytosis. So there are a lot of un unanswered questions and even some which may break this hypothesis because no one will be able to say how they are, okay? So I, I just showed you a little bit of the theory, but there are many steps that are completely unknown how that happened. Any other question? Yes. How the proteins get in, 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 in where? Yeah, for, for Tom and Tim, it's really enough just to know what they are and what they do. You don't really need to know the mechanism. It involves tens, if not hundreds, of different proteins. It's extremely complicated, and there are still bits that are unknown how, how things happen. Okay? So it's enough to know that they exist, where they are, and what they do. That's, that's enough. Okay. If there are no more questions, that's it for today. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be talking about the respiratory chain. <laughs>